So um, now comes the moment you've all been waiting for, the economist debate on global innovation. And I've been in the back. I mean, the, we have a, a pretty rowdy set of debaters who are ready to rumble. I'm going to bring them out. Pai Yan Wang, founder, founder and managing partner of the China India Institute. Give her a round of applause as well. Thank you. The proposition in front of this house, America is winning the innovation race. And so without any further ado, I'm going to welcome Hai Yan Wang to make the opening statement. Please. Uh, innovation race, who is going to be the winner? Recently, I asked this question to dozens of Chinese officials, uh, uh, scholars, and researchers, and entrepreneurs, and students. Amazingly, not a single one of them bet on the Chinese to win the innovation race. Actually, one of the VCs said that let's look beyond the hype. A lot of the Chinese technology ventures are really B2B or C2C. Back to Beijing, copy to China. <laughs> Chairman Mao said that uh, seek truth through facts. Let's look at some of the facts. If you uh, look at the um, number of uh, scientists and engineers, of course China has a lot. China produces 6 million uh, college graduates. But even China's Ministry of Education says that 55% of those are actually from short cycle courses. And what is more important, over the last 10 years, the massive drive for quantity has come at the sacrifice of quality six times over 10 years. You know, you can uh, stir fry out students, but you cannot fast cook professors, at least not the high quality <laughs> professors. And you know, a, a lot talk about China becoming the second largest R&D uh, spender. Yes, China is increasing its R&D expenditure, perhaps up to 2.5% by uh, of its GDP by 2020. But US has been spending 2.5% of its GDP or more over the last 50 years. And a baby cannot skip crawling to become running fast. That 50 years of R&D expenditure does accumulate a lot of uh, sophistication in you know, innovation. And when you look at the uh, patent numbers. A lot has been said about China now has a lot of uh, largest number of patent filings, but actually 95% of those filings are within China. You can take a technology here and do some twist and pay somebody in China 700 yuan, you can get a patent, and you can even sue the American inventors for patent infringement in the Chinese court. So when you look at the massive number of inputs and when you look at the output, it's very clear that China's R&D machine is not productive. And you wonder why it's not productive. Number one, innovation does require a rich stock of knowledge. And as I said, you know, it's hard to run fast and win a race if you haven't learned how to walk. Second, China's R&D fund allocation suffers heavily from being too politicized. In, in fact, the deans of life sciences of Peking University and Tsinghua University said in a science magazine article that it's an open secret that doing good research is not as good as schmoozing with the bureaucrats. China's research culture suffers from the academic dishonesty to such extent that in 2010, when the, uh, when the, uh, the uh, Association, China's Association for Science and Technology did a survey of 32,000 scientists. 55% of them knew at least one colleague who has committed academic misconduct. In another study, about one third of the 6,000 scientists admitted to themselves having conducted plagiarism in the past. Now, this kind of plagiarism not only wastes resources, but it also deters scientists from wanting to collaborate within China, let alone uh, with, with, uh, with uh, scientists outside of China. Now, another, another uh, drawback for China is China's education system suffers heavily from a model of road learning rather than creative uh, problem solving. You know, picking duck. One minute. Stop the picking duck may look shiny and crispy, but you cannot accept, uh, expect them to fly. <laughs> and you know, China's a weak IP protection environment. It deters cutting edge R&D, cutting edge R&D. And uh, you know, for China to build a law, rule by law society, it's going to take a long time. And, and uh, finally, as you said, that innovation is fresh thinking. 
independent thinking, freedom of expression, and having the DNA and the habit of challenging authorities are the requisite for innovation. You know, you have top-down forces which can pave roads, but it takes time, fertile soil, and a climate for innovation to grow a tree of apples. All right. There you have it. We're down to the closing arguments. And you can see this is, uh, is going to get even more interesting. One minute, one minute each side. So go ahead. I'm going to watch your Thank time. Thank you like so that. very much. And uh, my final statement is this, that innovation is the lifeblood of uh, America. For the coming decade, China can still ride its economic growth on technology adoption and, and digestion. But US will continue to push the frontier of technology. And smaller economies like Germany, like Japan, like South, South Korea cannot match up with U.S. economic muscle. China can catch up with the U.S. in terms of economic size and R&D spending by 2020. But China's productive productivity in terms of innovation is extremely, extremely low. And America is the melting pot of the best ideas and best talents from around the world. Just look at the participants of this room. Just smell the air in, of creativity. And I have no doubt America is winning. And, and, and finally, top-down forces can move mountains, but they cannot cultivate a rainforest of innovation, the hallmark of which is diversity and open competition. Okay, very good. Give her a round of applause.